Would you mind explaining, because I hadn't come across this before I read your book, um, sexual economic theory, what that term is, and how it can be co-opted? Yeah. So, okay. So it's really important to understand that this theory, it, it's sort of been appropriated by conservative right in this country for somewhat nefarious ends. Um, within social psychology, there, in 2003, there was this paper by Baumeister and Vose called Sexual Economics Theory. And essentially, what they argue is that in the heterosexual courtship market, women sell their sexuality uh, for sometimes non-monetary goods. So support, marriage, um, you know, you know, whatever, good grades, you know, the, um, <laughs> there, the, it doesn't necessarily mean like a direct monetary transaction. It means this sort of indirect transaction. So that what they argue in the book, in that, sorry, in that article is that when the price of sex is high, meaning that um, when women are, don't have opportunities outside of marriage, right? So in societies where women don't get educated, women don't have professional opportunities, and the only way for them to survive, uh, to actually put food on the table and pay the rent and feed their kids is to uh, transact a marriage bargain whereby they trade their sexuality and their reproductive capacity in exchange for a male support, the price of sex is really high. Like women essentially don't have sex unless marriage is the price. In a society where women have lots of opportunities, um, and the paradigmatic example, of course, is going to be in places like Denmark and Sweden, where women have not only uh, professional opportunities and education, but there's also a really robust social safety net so that their children will be educated, so that they'll have access to healthcare, so that they will be, um, you know, okay without a partner, without a husband, uh, or somebody to take care of them, kind of a patron, so to speak, a patriarch. Um, the price of sex is low, like, because women will have sex with whoever they want to have sex with because they're not using it as a, as a tool to meet their basic needs. And so Baumeister and Vose are very careful to kind of create a, a, an economic model. They basically take economics and they apply it to social psychology. And it's important to understand that within social psychology, their model has been deeply and profoundly criticized because they make these weird assumptions that I think don't actually bear out in reality. They assume that women have lower levels of libido naturally somehow than men do, um, that women are, you know, are more willing in some ways to use sex as a tool, but you know, they completely ignore the sort of sociological and um, you know, societal pressures on women to sort of walk that fine line between, you know, slut and prude, so to speak, that controls women's sexuality. And, and they don't really like try to go back and say, okay, what is some sort of like natural er state of female sexuality? They just ignore that question altogether. Mm -hmm. What's really interesting is that conservatives in this country have used this sexual economics theory as a way of blaming women for all of the kind of men who are failing to launch um, and are sort of living, you know, in their, within their parents' houses and not really getting jobs because the price of sex, like women are too emancipated, so the price of sex is too low. If the price of sex was higher, then, um, then somehow American men would get their, you know, crap together and they'd be able to go out and get jobs because they would want to have access. It, it's this Interesting really Interesting how they suddenly thing. care about data. Yeah, it, you know, it's, <laughs> it's and there's, a, there's an interesting video that you can watch upon this. So, so I was really curious about this argument because unbeknownst in some ways to Baumeister and Vose, who wrote this paper in 2003, they were essentially recapitulating 150 years of socialist theory about sexual and love and family relationships under capitalism. So what I pointed out in the book is that if you actually go back and you read socialist theorists like Friedrich Engels or August Babel or Alexandra Kollontai, who actually write specifically about the family and sexuality and love, especially Kollontai, Kollontai here is a really key figure, it's almost as if they're admitting that love under capitalism is transactional mm -hmm. and it always will be because we live in a market economy. And what they don't say 
Um, but what you can easily infer from that article, and, and by the way, there are subsequent studies where they try to um, provide empirical data for their claims. So there's, a, I think, Baumeister and Mendoza do a paper where they actually, they actually look at um, a, 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 an independent measure of women's economic independence, and they correlate it with uh, you know, a sex survey that Playboy did or something like that about sexual practices. And they find very clearly that in societies where women have really high level of, of economic independence, that, you know, people tend to have sex earlier, they have sex more often, um, you know, th that it's basically a much more sexually liberated society. In societies where women have almost no economic independence, uh, outside of marriage, then um, there's very, very little sex going on. And it's usually sex that's going on in marriage. And of course, this is exactly what conservatives love about this. So if you right. take away all of women's rights, you take away their education, their opportunities for um, getting in ahead professionally, if you outlaw abortion, and if you outlaw birth control, boom, you can go back to a world in which men have all the power, and the price of sex is really high. So um, what I loved about this, you know, again, as somebody sitting outside steeped in 150 years of socialist theory about women's rights and sexuality and socialist theories of love, kind of a dialectical materialist analysis of love and how love might change, is that essentially what Baumeister and Vos say and subsequently through their empirical studies suggest and support is this idea that we would all have better relationships under socialism because they would be less transactional. Yeah. They would actually be more authentic. They would be, they would be um, you know, more based on love and mutual attraction and affection, which is exactly what Colin Ty was writing about in the 1920s, than they are under capitalism where everything, our affections, emotions, and attentions become commodities to be traded with prices determined by the vicissitudes of supply and demand. And I think that that is something that we really need to think about because it's really revolutionary. When you start to apply that to your own life, how can you decommodify yourself? How you can decommodify your relationships? It can be extremely empowering. Yeah. And I liked how you kind of just gave like a very simple um, example because I think, you know, we can kind of get lost in, well, if you're paying a woman for sex and that could be like literally paying a woman for sex or it could be more like paying rent, food, whatever, you know, is your concern going to be her pleasure or is it kind of like, okay, I've compensated this person, so yes. I'm, I'm going to get off. And then you kind of make the example of like, if you pay someone to clean your house, like you're not going to be that concerned of like, oh, like I really hope she enjoyed cleaning my house. I notice <laughs> I do say she, because most people who clean houses are she. Right. And, you know, versus being like, yeah, she got paid to clean my house. I don't care, if, you know, if she enjoyed it or not, especially in the context of capitalism. If you pay someone for something, you're not too caught up in, in the other emotional aspects, which is a whole other problem. Um, Absolutely. I yeah. I think that the, the one thing is that it, it's important to point out that in the book, like there are these anecdotes, right? There are these very grounded examples. And I want to say that a lot of those examples come from teaching, yeah, right? Because I have to like talk about these theories in class with undergraduates between the ages of 18 and 22 who may not know the history of socialism or socialist women's rights or socialist feminism or even, you know, broader sort of theories of political economy. And so it's really useful as somebody who, who has been teaching for God, you know, it's kind of embarrassing about 20 years now to that's say, great. That's not embarrassing. It's wonderful. <laughs> to, say um, to, to be able to kind of give people very concrete examples of what this looks like. And, and so, you know, sometimes the anecdotes, I mean, I'm very, I feel like those are really important because they allow people to kind of understand the personal stories behind the theories. And, and in that, in the book, I want to, not only, you know, appeal to people or uh, reach people intellectually, I think that's important too, but I also feel like it's really important to make these, uh, these theories relatable, to appeal to people's emotional understanding. And, and as you were saying, when you're an 18 year old and you heard this woman, you know, basically saying, when I get the guy in the right position, then I can ask for whatever it is I want. You know, I think there are a lot of women in that situation that don't want to admit it. Um, but there, but there are a lot of women in extremely precarious positions in this country. You know, even around something as simple as healthcare. If mm -hmm. you get your healthcare through your spouse's employer, you cannot get divorced without losing your healthcare. Right. And this is a real. This puts people in an incredibly precarious position. Again, especially during a pandemic. You know, right now the New York Times did an article, I think a week or two ago, about the coronavirus divorce rate. 
yeah. right? Which is that like a lot of women are waking up to the fact that their marriages are really unhealthy or unhappy or abusive. And yet at the same time, as much as they might want to get a divorce, many of them can't if they're getting their health care through their husband's employer. Um, because you don't want to lose healthcare during a pandemic, you know? So you have this terrible dilemma. I think a lot of women in the United States are facing this right now. There's so much going on that's terrible. But a, a, one of the many terrible things is that you have women that are being trapped in relationships because they have to choose between maintaining a relationship with somebody that they're no longer in love with, who may be treating them very badly. We also know that domestic violence rates have gone through the roof um, or losing access to healthcare in case they get sick during what is a international pandemic. It's pretty horrific if you think about it in a country that's supposedly like the land of the quote unquote free. Yeah, it's, it's really sick. 